Father, we magnify your name today. We thank you, God. We bless you. We bless you. We bless you for this, oh God, remarkable occasion, dear God, where we can come together, where we can learn and be healed, where God, hallelujah, that which have been, even in times past, have not been shared. Today, we praise you, God for your goodness and mercy of making this available to men, men who can come together, men who can respond to your, to your goodness and, and, to be he and to healing. And so we thank you for, oh God, our, our organizers. We thank you for our, our, our presenters, God. We praise you for all that will be done today, God. We just exalt your name and give you all the glory and all the honor and all the praise as we look forward with enthusiasm and with excitement of God, that which you will do today uh, amongst us men, Father, because the time has come and now is because we see an urgency in the world today where men need to, to come together for healing, to be able to be free to speak, to be able to be touched. Oh God, to just be open to what is what you're doing and what you're saying. God, we really bless you for this occasion and for this opportunity, Father God. And so we thank you today in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. As I introduce today a tremendous man of God, he's all things man. Let me just put it there. He's all things a man of God. He's all things a family man. Uh, he have been my former lecturer in a few things. And so I, I willingly and graciously and excitedly welcome to the platform, the man of God. It is with pleasure that I introduce today our speaker uh, uh, today, Reverend Errol Karen. Reverend, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Sterling Bain, my good brother and friend. It's so good to see you. And I uh, it's indeed a, a joy to be here and be part of this, um, this special group of men that have gathered here today. And um, I'm looking forward to what the Lord will do in our presence uh, as we gather here and he we allow him to have his way in our in our gathering today. As as uh, Pastor Sterling was preparing to to introduce me, I'm sitting here and the Lord brought something to my mind. So I, I want to um, do a little um, exercise before I actually um, do my presentation here. So um, last week Thursday, I um, was my birthday, and and I have a couple went out to dinner together with the, with their family. And during the dinner, um, uh, the husband, he started asking me some questions. And for a, for a guy who was 32, he was asking the very good questions. You know, he said, so what would you say to a 32 year old man like me? You know, what are the things that you would, you would, you would want to pass on to me at, at, at your age right now? You know, and, and I said to him, well, life goes through stages. And depends on where you are in life. I said, you know, where you are in life right now, the focus is about um, your family and a career. And, you know, you think of those kind of things. Um, but then um, at my age, you know, uh, those things are not uh, a career and, and, and um, money and all that stuff. It's not, it's not in the radar anymore. It's, it's, um, it's, so he says, so what does concern you? And I said, well, what concerns me is, at this stage in my life is what is the legacy I'm leaving? Um, how do I want to remember, be remembered? How do people experience me when I interact with them? That's the things that concerns me right now. You know, I don't, I don't worry about the things that I used to when I was, you know, a younger age as I, I did now, because that is part of life. But at this stage of the game, it is about for me, you know, um, being 65, what is the legacy I'm leaving? So, but as you think of your life right now, as you think of where you are right now, what are the things that really concerns you that you want to know is happening for you? Um, where I sit here down the road, I can see um, there is light at the end of the tunnel, but you're going to have to walk in the way of the Lord for him to take you there. Okay. All right. So the topic for today is um, hurt people, hurt people, but God heals. And I want to break that down into three three. Um, 
point as I, as I present that to you. And, and um, to say to you that it is important for us to understand that um, life, I mean, right now we heard some of the conversation today and, and some of the conversation represent pain because, because people are hurting. But when we think about hurt people, hurt people, first we want to think about how, how do we become a hurt people? What, what happened? You know, what has created this, this, this cycle of hurt that we see uh, in humankind? And it's everywhere, you know, um, where we see so much hurt and people are hurting people, some, some violently, some, you know, um, not so violent, but they're still doing it. And, you know, I, I hear people talk and talking about peace and, you know, and, and things getting better. I, I, I think I understand enough about humanity and God and sin and fallenness, fallenness to say that there is no peace to come where this world will ever, someone was saying, um, I was listening to one of the leaders of the world making a presentation to the UN and saying, you know, we have the power to stop all the wars and there should be no more wars. And, and I'm thinking, you haven't yet grasped the magnitude of the brokenness of humankind and to recognize that the only time we'll have a war is when Christ returns and redeems us all from our brokenness. But until then, we'll continue to hurt each other. But how do we, uh, you know, what has led to us becoming hurt what is what you know? Why are we hurt so that we hurt people? Well, I want to take you back to Genesis uh, and and God's creation, and and I do this part of this presentation, and I do my emotional wounds because I I believe that this is the root the, the, the root cause of us being hurt, and that leads us to hurt hurt people. When you go back to Genesis chapter um, one, two, and three, God creates. Uh, this magnificent creation with all of its beauty and creates uh, humankind and, you know, to reflect his image. And, and um, God just placed Adam and Eve in the garden and says, it's all here for you. Just go ahead and enjoy. And, you know, um, you take control of everything. And, and they, they were, they were living, they were living as God intended for life to, to be. But God said, there was one thing I, de I desire not to do. Do not, do not mess with that one tree in the center of the garden. The thing that God created humankind with is the, 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 the will, the freedom of the will, that he never took that from us. You know, because if, if we don't have a freedom of a will, then we are not, we are not free. We are, we are robots. We, then, you know, there's no decision to make. We'll just do whatever God makes us do. But God is not that kind of a God. He created us with the freedom to choose. And he said to Adam and Eve, that tree is for you not to, you know, and uh, and again, um, as we see when we get to chapter three now, um, the serpent comes along and begins to present temptation to 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 Eve. While you know, the, Adam couldn't have been far away because um, he was there when she handed him, you know, the, the, the fruit to be disobedient as well. But the, the interesting thing about this conversation is, nowhere did God ever give Eve instruction about the garden. He gave it to Adam, and Adam was the one to pass it on to Eve. So Adam is the one that heard directly from God what is expected in the garden. He told his wife. So obviously, already, he's beginning to, to, to not hold up his part of the responsibility. But what I want you to see how the hurt entered into humankind is after they disobeyed God, after they sinned, the first thing we see is that in verse 7 of chapter 3, at that moment, their eyes were opened, and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So before they were naked and, and, and they were fine, but now that they have disobeyed God, shame. Shame is a negative emotion. Before sin, there was no shame. Shame represents pain as we'll, as we'll see. It, it shows up all the time when there is pain. And so there is, there is shame that has come into, in, in, into play as they disobeyed God. And then we go to verse eight. Uh, when the cool of the evening breeze were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord walking about in the garden. So they hid from the Lord among the trees. They never did this before, but now they're hiding, you know. So not only there is shame, but now disobedience and sin leads to hiding, you know. And we hide our hurts. We hide, you know, um, our brokenness. We hide the things that are, that, are, that are, we don't want people to see. We want people to see us in a certain way. So we carry the shame and we hide, we hide the brokenness and the hurt that we carry. Um, 
So so not only there is there is um hiding, but then God says, you know, um where were you? And and so he said, I saw you, we heard you coming, you know, and we hid. Uh, then the Lord said, Call us to him, where are you? He replied, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. Why did you hide? I was afraid. So I want you to see the, the other emotion here. Shame. Now there is fear. And there is hiding. And the fourth thing we see is that when God confronts Adam, you know, in verse 11 of chapter 3, who told you that you were naked? The Lord asked. You, um, have you eaten from the, um, the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? And listen to verse 12. What Adam's reply was. The man replied, it was the woman who gave me the fruit and I ate it. God gave him the instruction, but now he's telling God the woman gave it to him. That's another conversation we could have. And the Lord asked the woman, you know, who have, uh, why have you done this? You know, and she said, it's a serpent. So, so we keep going. We keep, we keep um, moving the goalposts of whose responsibility. But what I want you to see is Adam passes the blame now. And he said to the Lord in verse 13, that, um, the, the woman you gave me, the woman you gave me. So we have fear, shame, hiding, and blame. This is, is the root of the, 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 the hurt. It is true that hurt people hurt people, but it, it originates in the disobedience of humankind towards God when God said, you ought not to do this. you know. And so now we have hurt has entered in. And we are, when we are hurt, we feel shame, we feel fear, we hide, and we blame. Right, and then the next two human interactions that we see, um, you know, in 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 Genesis involves one killing the other. Again, pain. What led Cain to kill his brother Abel? Jealousy. Jealousy is emotional pain. You 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 dislike someone for what they can do and what you know. So. The next interaction we, we begin to see. So this begin, the long and the short of, 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 of this is that we, we come into the world. We come into the world to the care of people who already have pain. And they pass their pain on to us and we pass it down to those that we care for. So it's a, it's a, it's a perpetual human generational thing that keeps moving and until we we this is a journey until we meet Christ okay that to recognize that we 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 inherited pain pain was passed on to us and we'll talk about some of those and and then now we are going to pass it on if we don't become aware of ours and how we deal with it and try the best you can you will still pass it on but the, the goal here is that we understand our pain where it came from find our healing so we could deal with others not passing pain onto them, but being able to be compassionate to them because we understand how the pain is passed on and how we too can make a difference in understanding the, the pain we carry. So how is this pain passed on? It's an emotional, emotionally transmitted. From the womb, we told, the research told us, and now we know that from the womb, the emotional pain is passed on. If a, 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 a woman is pregnant, and she's living in a very stressful situation where she's physically ab uh, abused or uh, emotionally abused, or she's always tense. So the, the child picks up that emotion. So the child comes into the world already with, with anxiety and fear, and you touch the child and the child is jumpy. And because the child has the same emotional wounds that the mother was experiencing during pregnancy, now comes into the world already having to deal with that. Okay. And one of the things we know is, um, the effects of um, alcohol when a when a when a when a woman is pregnant and she drinks alcohol, um, you know the, the the child born with alcohol fetal syndrome where the child to the point where the child doesn't even have a sense of right or wrong. That's the effect that it has on the brain. Okay, um, but it's passing on the pain. You know, people drink alcohol to numb pain. They do drugs to numb pain. They sexual addiction to numb pain. They overeat and. It's always we're trying to run from the pain that we inherited, that we carry, that was passed on to us, you know. And so it starts in the womb. And then we know um, 
it goes to about uh, nine or ten during those formative years is when most of the pain is passed on to us because up to that point, the only way a child interprets the behavior of adults is registers with them emotionally because the rational mind hasn't developed yet where they can process why is this person doing this? So this person could be, they, they don't have that ability. So they, they, all of the treatment they get, whether it's loving, caring, protective, or abusive, or helicopter overprotective, all of the pain is passed on in this time that's going to shape this child as an adult that is going to be sitting there. And as you will see a little later, when we become adult now, it's that what rises up within us. We ourselves being unaware that a lot of our behaviors are not really attached to the person in the present, the way they're behaving. They're the, only the trigger. The real pain is from what you're carrying because you inherited this pain that you weren't even aware of. But now it's there and it triggers a new behavior. And then when we do the work, we can go back and, and it comes back to us and we can see a memory or an experience and know this is where this is started. This is how this happened. This is where this began. And, and then we can able to do the work of the healing. So basically what I want you to understand is, is that the pain that we, we, the way we are hurt, you know, hurt people, hurt people, but we are first hurt because it's part of the generational uh, consequence of disobedience to God. But it is, and as a result, we pass it on to each other. So we, we do things to hurt ourselves because we don't like ourselves. Okay. Um, as our brother was talking about, you know, having attempted suicide a couple of times, because that leads to a place of sheer desperation of I am unworthy. I don't, you know, I'm not worth anything. I am no good, you know. So we allow others to use and abuse us because we don't care uh, for ourselves enough or love ourselves enough to say, no, I will not allow you to treat me this way or in such and such a way. So a lot of times, a lot of the abuse we go through, a lot of the things we allow to happen is because we don't like ourselves enough. Because we still look at ourselves through the, the lens of our brokenness and fail to realize that, wait, God came to bring healing for my brokenness. That is not who I am. I don't measure myself by that. But the world has a tendency of doing that to us. And so we take that on as who we are. But I hope today I can help you to see that a little differently. But basically what I wanted to establish at the beginning is this is how our hurt start this is where our hurts came from and it just keep <clears throat> moving on from generation to generation and getting worse because we're finding ways to be even more violent to each other and it's out of the pain that we carry that we hurt each other because we have pain so we're going to pass that pain on consciously or unconsciously to those that we are responsible for or have to interact with us i never i didn't have parents i grew up in different homes, I you know I didn't have any any kind of background, you know, of of how um, what it is to have a family. You know, if the people around me they were having children, and they were you know my sister had her first child when she was fourteen. I mean, you know, there's a sexual abuse, emotional abuse, so there was nothing that that I could really take from my upbringing that I wanted to carry on. But I could say that now because I had to make a decision: what do I want to take from my upbringing to carry on? Okay. So I came in, I came into this in, 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 with more hurt inflicted to me in my growing up years than I don't even, ever remember anybody giving me a hug and telling me they loved me, they appreciated me. I, I, I don't know what that is. You know, people were nice to me when they wanted something from me. Nobody ever told me I was always stupid. I was always dumb. I could never do anything. So I, that's how I was raised. But then I met Jesus when I was 18. And, and so in my mind, coming to Jesus, that's it, you know. But what I didn't realize was coming to Jesus was, was the beginning of the journey. I had to do a lot of work and my own personal hurt that I was carrying in the way I was living my life, that I was, I was, I was doing things that was inconsistent, what I know in my head to be right, but emotionally I was taken away into them and I was doing them, not because Christ wasn't able, it's because I hadn't even identified or recognized what it was that I that was leading me to this kind of behavior. See, So um, as I met Christ and as I began to journey, I came to the place one day when I realized that I have to take responsibility for the man I have become. I just can't say because I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, 
it's all okay. I had to put in the hard work, years of hard work, and still doing uh, hard work because I said this journey of dealing with with the pain that we carry is is a lifelong journey. But it it, it become we become more aware of it and we are better able to deal with it. So now I have a family, and and I remember when I was getting married, my you know my mother in law um, to be at the time. We went to a park and we had a conversation, and she said to me, she said these words. She says. So how are you going to build a family with my daughter when you never grew up in a family? And all I could say to my mother now is, you know, I don't know, but I know that the God will help us to build a family together. They do build a family that didn't that that was perfect, not by a long stretch of the imagination, but by God's grace. You know, out of nothing to offer. To build something, to be doing what I'm doing now, is because I came along, I found Christ, but I had to do the hard work. I had to become aware of who I am, what's the pain I'm carrying, identify it, and I'll talk to you about that, and, and get the healing so I could be the man that I am today. We, we live in a society that doesn't allow us as men to, to engage with our hurt, to engage with our pain. We kind of have to be tough, you know. And we go to churches that that are afraid to deal with that. We're supposed to be saved and sanctified. And anytime we talk about anything that's broken or pain, they want to distance themselves from us because you know why? Because they themselves haven't yet faced their own pain. You know. So they they try to 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 they don't know how to deal with it. So when you show up at your pain, they will say, you know what, this is not a place for you. They don't say those words. You know, have you prayed? Have you fasted? You know, have you done that? And and that is supposed to fix it. But 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 as you will see, that doesn't fix it until you are actually identifying what you're trying to fix. So the pain you carry in, brother, is finding the place, and maybe this is the place we start this conversation, of you can be honest with those pain and talk about them and identify where they're coming from. And here's the hardest thing for us in this journey I had to do. I had to be able to let go of those people who have hurt me even if they never acknowledge you have hurt me. Even if I try to talk to them and say, what are you talking about? I have to be able to let that go in order for me to be free so I can be the man that I am today, okay? Uh, so yes, um, how do we get men to open up? Uh, I think what's happening here, I'm talking to you today and I'm not talking to you out of training. I'm just talking to you about who I am. And because I'm talking to you about who I am, I could invite you into a conversation. The way we get people, and we, not everybody will do it. Everybody has to decide they want to do it. But the way I get people to talk about themselves and where they are in their pain is like I do. I, I talk about me. I have to let people know what Christ has done for me so they feel safe. They say, oh, oh, you know someone who's a struggle with sexual addiction. You know what is have a difficult marriage. You know what it, you know. And when I talk about me, people feel that they can relax and they say, you know, I never told anybody this, but this is what's going on. This is what's happening. And then when they tell me that, I offer grace. You know, I said, that might be difficult. You know, um, what do you think you can do to make that different? You know, and so how we invite people in the conversation, we must be a witness of the transformation. Not a witness by telling them, a witness by letting them know what we experience, not what could happen to them, but what has happened to us. And they get now the, the, the confident that it could happen to them as well. How do you yep. deal with the person, the pain and the hurt, when the person you go to, to address the pain only add yes. to your hurt? Right. So wrong person to go to. That's not the person you want to go to. You have to get your healing. I said earlier, get your healing. You could heal without even the person acknowledging the hurt you. And this is the, this is the, this is the challenge for us. Somehow we feel that the person who hurt us must own it and must say they're sorry, whatever. No, leave them there. Leave them there. It's their pain that is causing them to cause you pain. So the more you try to lean into them is the more pain they're going to cause you. You need to step away from that. Own your part of the, the, the pain. Find healing for that so that you could deal with this person later on and not let them have that kind of effect on you anymore because you have worked with the pain that they have caused you. But if you're waiting on the people who hurt you, to be a catalyst to your healing, you will never get healed. You have to own that and find your healing without them even saying, I'm sorry. They may never say, they might tell you, you deserve it. And that's okay. Because you want to be healed. You can't let them continue to set the agenda for you. 
So I, I can't emphasize enough, guys, these people who have hurt us, we can't be waiting on them to free us from the pain. We need to take responsibility for that. And even if they don't want to change, you work on you. You have to be able, yeah, you have to find the right people. And you know, maybe, maybe it's a group right here, a guys who are all hurting and who could be honest and who could help each other. I, I have a group of guys I meet with every Wednesday, four pastors from different parts of the, uh, the globe. And we cut together and I'm able to, to talk about my pain, my frustration, and these guys are there and we talk together, but we help each other. So what I'm saying is don't wait for the people who hurt you to change for your healing to start. You have to recognize that I'm hurt. How can I deal with my pain? And how we get men to open up is creating the space, the environment. Yeah, you talk to people and they're going to, you know, I now at my age and where I've been through life, I say, you can't embarrass me. You can't tell a secret about me. You can't, because you know, if I tell you something and tell somebody else, the reality is it's true. It's true. So if you tell them and they say, oh, I heard so, yeah, it's true. You did this and that. Yeah, I did. So I don't have, you, you know, you can't, you can't take secrets about me because I don't have any secrets. I am who I am. And so, but to get there and be comfortable with your brokenness and your mistakes and your faults and everything else, you have to own that space and say, this is me, I'm broken. I need to be healed. I want healing. And you seek those places and God will bring the healing for you. And then you're okay with you. Your yes is yes. Your no is no. You're authentic. You're not afraid. Something will come out. They're going to find out. They're going to, yeah, no, no. Okay. But move away from the people who are hurting you and thinking until they change, you're going to be healed. You need to seek your healing without they even changing. Excellent, Reverend. Okay. Uh, one further question. Yeah. Would you say that modern and postmodern thinking, I mean, like especially social media, has influenced mm. how we treat with one another and how Huge. we deal with one another that is affecting our marriages today and not we and I'm talking about the church and we don't respond as the words we should respond as the Huge. word has instructed us. Would you say Huge. That? That's huge. I mean, social media, you know, I, I was listening to to a, a little clip of an interview just last night. And this this woman was talking about how, you know, how social media has de-socialized us. You know, it it, it we we don't we don't even know how to um interact and you know and socialize and connect anymore. We'll, it, it has disconnected us. It doesn't connect, you know, the social media is supposed to uh, bring us together, it has disconnected us because now we we don't know how to do that. So we, we, we follow social media. We flip into things all the time, okay? Things are moving quickly, little clips, little this, little that. And guess what? We want life to be that way, see? And so we approach, and so we don't even know how to connect with our spouse. How many times you've been to the restaurant and you look at a couple and they're by the table and they're both of them, the heads buried in their phone. They don't talk anymore. I was pointing out to my wife, we were in the restaurant last, last Saturday and we're sitting there having a little breakfast and look over the table there, a mother and her daughter. The mother is on her phone. The little girl is about seven or eight. She's have a little screen there having breakfast. So yes, it has influenced us big time. And, and, and to know how to um, get ourselves disconnected from that. And that's one of the ways we hide from our pain. We, you know, when we get upset and we feel the pain, we scroll through social media. So it makes us feel better. And you know, we see people's things on social media. And we think, well, I need to be like that. I want to be like that. I want to be like that. And it's not real. You know, people just capturing these small seconds of moments that look so great and make you think that's their life, but they're not telling you about all the things. And then what you find out, some of these social media people, they commit suicide. If life was so good, why did that happen? Okay, they were only showing you the parts that they want you to think that that's who they were. But the reality is there was great pain and suffering that they weren't letting people know that's real. So social media is a huge contributor. And I say to you guys, engaging in conversation with people you know, engaging with your with your spouse whatever you need to leave the phone out of the room you need to turn it off you need to it not to be there so that you can have healthy conversations and not just scroll through the thing all the time all right so let me see if i can move you to how we how we hurt people because we carry our emotional hurt most people are unaware that they do carry emotional hurt so they behave in ways that hurt others Sadly, most of us don't realize how hurtful our behaviors are. 
okay? We inflict pain because we carry pain. Now, let me tell you some ways we do that and see if this, any of this resonates with you. How do we hurt others? By our words. We say things, you're stupid, you're an idiot, you know, what's wrong with you, you know, um, I'm fed up with you, you know. Um, the, you know, the things I would hear growing up was, was that you could never do anything for anybody to tell you thanks, okay? Um, those kind of things resonate with you, you know, you're, you're stupid, you're dumb, but we use words, you know. Some, someone once says, you know, sticks and stone may break my bones, but words has never hurt me yet. Well, that's a lie because most of the pain we carry was inflicted to us by words we heard that was said to us, okay? Silent treatment, one way we hurt people. We figure if we stay silent, we know you want to ask, we're gonna shut up, we're gonna ignore you, we're gonna leave the room, we're gonna, you know. So our thing is to inflict, um, make you feel bad. So we get silent, okay? Um, emotional outburst, or we lose it, like someone was talking earlier, you know. Um, we just explode and we, and we you know, and, and, we, and, we are, and you know what we say? You know, if you didn't do that, I wouldn't behave this way, right? So we, we, we're blaming the other person, you know. Um, name calling, which I already mentioned, you know, calling people names, we, we inflict hurt. Controlling, you know, controlling everything, you know, um, controlling the money, controlling where you go, controlling what you do. You just, people can't be themselves anymore. It, and you're doing it to show them you have power. So again, Using someone faults or mistakes against them, reminding them, you know, you did this. You know, you know, I, I talk to couples all the time, you know, and and something has happened, and you know, and and years on, and they're still talking about it, you know, um, and so they use it when when it's it's a weapon, when they feel they're losing the argument, they just pull that out, you know, and they know they're going to shut the other person down. Okay, uh, abandonment when you leave people unattended when they were depending on you, you know, they, they feel hurt, you know, how could you do this? How could you do it? You know, and, and you say, well, no, that was my big deal. Why are you making the thing about that? You know, but it's because of where we find ourselves withholding essential things from someone as a form of control. We hurt people. We make fun of someone. We embarrass them in public. We laugh at them. You know, um, it, it's so painful to see even spouse, you know, a husband and his wife in public around family or, or vice versa. You know, to, to just going to demonstrate, you know, and just, but they're inflicting so much hurt when they make fun of them and they embarrass them. There's this thing that, that I, I mentioned um, sometime back on one of my presentation, mind rape. Mind rape is when someone is telling you something that they believe or they think about and you totally destroy them. That is the stupidest thing you ever heard. How could you say that? How could you even believe that? So now you, what you're doing is that you're forcing your your thoughts and your way of thinking upon them and you know it's to rape someone is to force yourself upon them sexually but that sexual rape but mind rape is to force yourself upon, upon someone um, mentally and make them think what they're saying and thinking is stupid because you are the one with the education and you're smart i talked to a lot of couples like that where you know he has the education and she doesn't or, or vice versa and so this one is intimidated when they try to talk the other one make them feel that they're stupid or whatever okay gaslighting you know we're familiar with that that phrase it is make it it's, it's getting convincing someone that what they're saying is not true you know and um and then we do physical abuse sexual abuse all these are ways in which we hurt people okay but we normally do those things out of our own pain is what i'm trying to say Okay, we, we would say it's the other person that caused us to do it, right? We will say she, um, she doesn't manage money well, so I have to control her. Or we'll say it's only when I yell that, they, that, that, they, that, that she hears me, you know. Or we'll say those things. But, but let's pause for a while and say we are followers of Jesus Christ. That's who we define ourselves as. So, so what does Christ expect from us? And you and I know that. We know in our heads. That's not how we want to be. But we still end up being there. And we say many times, I'm not going to do this again. This is the last time. I'm sorry. And then it happens again. Because we carry pain, we inflict pain. By our words, by our treatment of people, by how we make people feel when they're wrong us. You know, that's one thing when the young past, my, my mentor, and my mentee, when he asked me, he says, you know, so what are your concerns? I said, one of my concerns is, how people experience me at my age. I am concerned how people experience me. It doesn't matter, my wife, my daughter, 
my, my work colleagues, a stranger who come to do business at a conference center. I am very aware of how they're experiencing me. And I want that, that, that the experience to be an awareness of the presence of Christ in me and how I deal with them. Even when they are trying to rip me off, you know, with the business I'm trying to do, whatever, I am very aware that I am my impression on people, how people experience me is a representation of Christ in me. And so I, I am aware of that. So what I want to take you to, which we can have touched on already in many different ways, is, is, is how does God heal our hearts? You know, how do we experience the healing? Before we can, but before we can understand how God heals the heart, uh, we must first understand ourselves so, so we will know what we are asking God to heal. This is, this is important, okay? We need to know what we're asking God to heal, you know. Um, the Living Bible, I think it's in is it Proverbs uh, 16, it says, you can't heal a, a, a wound by saying it's not there, okay? So we need to talk a little about understanding our hurt and understanding, you know, and we have many. And, you know, I have I've worked at my hurt one at a time, you know, where I could walk through the things and I can, I can, I can find a freedom. I, I, I've had to walk through hurts where I've never even said to the person who hurt me that you hurt me because I know they wouldn't grasp that. They would be so mad at me for even thinking that they were hurting me. So I had to just forgive and ask God to bring healing and to move on with my life. I can't be stuck because someone doesn't want to acknowledge what they have done to me. I need to find a freedom in Christ. That's why, that's the reason. And let me say this here as we get into this. When Christ was teaching the Sermon on the Mount, he said to his disciples and the people listening, you know, the Bible says an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. He says, but no, not in, not in this new kingdom. In this new kingdom, you have to love your enemies. Okay? You have to love your enemies. If your enemies ask you for this, you give them more than they ask you for. Now, the world which you live in today, unfortunately, can't grasp that concept. And sad to say, the church at, at times struggled to grasp that concept. What Christ did there is that he started with the worst relationship you can ever have. It's an enemy, someone who wants to destroy you. And he says, you have to start from there to forgive and to love. And it's not for the enemy. It's not whether the enemy ever acknowledged what they've done to you or not. He says, you need to forgive and you need to love. And the reason that is crucial and that's essential, man, is because it's the only way we're going to find the freedom from the pain that we're carrying so that we can truly allow God to use us, okay? And the reason all of us struggle for God to use us in a mighty way is because the hurts we carry get in the way, okay? So, so you carry the hurt of poverty, how you were treated as a child, how you never had, you never had enough, you know? And so now you remember people treating you badly, laughing at you, laughing at your torn up shoes or making fun of you. So you carry that pain. Now you're an adult, and now you get a job, or you're in ministry, and you want you want to make sure you're kind of you're coming like Judas now. What will you give me? And and the money is what's driving you, whether you're going to accept it or not, because you're carrying this pain of poverty and this fear, and forgetting it's God who called you, and because God who called you, God will take care of you. But the pain of your poverty and the pain of being laughed at is driving you to make sure that never happened to you again. While in the meantime, you're not you're missing what God is wanting you to do. That is what I mean by the pain of the past having the kind of impact in the present because you don't know where it's coming from or what's causing you to be that way. So let me just quickly tell you this. I, I do this in my other presentation. Help you to understand how our brain works, how our brain takes in information. And so you will understand better how the hurt shows up, okay? When we get some information, whether we hear it, we see it, we smell it, we taste it, or we feel it, our five senses, that information immediately registers in our brain. And once it does, it goes to three different places in our brain instantaneously. Okay, It goes to the frontal cortex, which we call the executive brain, where we make all our rational decisions. Okay, That's where if we could live there, we wouldn't make a mistake. Okay. Um, it goes to the amygdala, which is the base of the brain where or this emotional center, where all our emotions come from, where we have all our emotional reaction. 
And it, then it goes to the hippocampus where we store all our memories. Everything we ever experienced in life is stored there, whether you can remember it now or not. If enough happens and the right thing happens, you ever had this time when a memory comes back because something just brought it up? It's all there. But here's the, the, the dilemma we face. When that information comes in, the amygdala, the base of the brain, the emotional part of the brain, responds five times faster than the, rash, the rational, the frontal cortex, the executive brain. So my ability to process this in a logical way is overtaken by my emotion because that's five times faster than responding to it. So we see something and we get scared or we, or we react emotionally or, you know, um, because it's the, emo and then later we stop and realize, why did I do that? I didn't have to do that. Now, now you're thinking, but before you were emotioning, that's my word I created for you tonight, emotion in him. But you were responding out of your emotion. But the hippocampus, which all the memories are stored, responds 10 times faster than the rational brain. So what happens when, when something, when, when your, 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 your wife or your girlfriend or somebody yells at you or says something to you that triggers a memory of the way your mother or your sister or a, a school teacher treated you or something, that memory and that emotion takes over and you have a rushing reaction that is totally logical because your, your rational brain doesn't have the capacity to process it because you have allowed your emotions and your memory to give the response. And what you have then, you have a blow up or you have a, you have a shut down or you have something and, and your wife or your girlfriend or your friend or kind of wondering what happened? What, what, what just happened here? What just happened there is your amygdala and your hippocampus has taken over and your ability to be rational. And then, and then you calm down a little later and you're talking to yourself. How could you be so stupid? Why do you do it? How do you all let that happen to you? you know? And, and, and you, so you're calling yourself all these stupid names and you're mad at yourself. But what you're not realizing is if you could understand what's happening here, you could be more self-aware and be able to deal with it, okay? So I just wanted to present that for you to have an understanding how you respond to things when they come to you as information, whether you're having a, whether you're having a phone conversation with your ex-wife or your, or, or your girlfriend or, or your mother or your sister, or whatever, when you're having your reaction, know where it's coming from. This is what's happening, this process, especially when you have those reactions where you, after you calm down, you're so mad at yourself for having had that reaction. It's because the emotions and the memory it was reacting, not your ability to process the situation. Any questions on that before I move on? Should we, yeah. what, uh, put things in place or practice or what do we do right. then to address okay. That's good. that we know that this is an issue? Right. What do we right. do or put in place so that we are, we are not subjected to this situation in the future. Right. Okay. That's good. That's a good question. So, you know, the first thing you have to recognize is self-awareness is key to your healing. Okay. We hear self-awareness and we think it's meditation and all the things. Let me just stop you and say, self-awareness means I pay attention to what I'm feeling. I pay attention to what I'm saying. I pay attention to my demeanor. I am very self-aware. And when I talk to people, I give them exercises in self-awareness, you know, I say things like, so I ask people questions like, when, when you put on your shoes, how, how do you put on your shoes? Do you put on both socks first and then shoes, or do you put on a, your, your, your left socks and shoes first and then your right socks and shoes first after, you know, when you brush your teeth, you know. Um, those, we do those things unconsciously. But those are little things. Self-awareness self -awareness says, I am very present in the moment of what I'm doing, you know. So you sit down to put your shoes on and, and you pay attention. Okay, so today I'll put on my left sock first. And right. that, that sounds silly, but what it is, it is, is about being self-aware. So self-awareness is key here because when you become self-aware, then you realize, okay, this, right now I'm feeling all of these emotions overtaking me right now. You know, I, I, and then you have to, then you think, I know I don't need to say anything. I just need to take a step back, need to breathe. And as a whole other conversation, I'll teach you about breathing. Your breathing, you know, is, is your um, thermostat. Your, it's your emotional thermostat. It helps you to control your emotions, okay? 
if you learn to breathe, when you feel in, when someone is hyperventilating, what do they tell them to do? Breathe in a bag, right? Breathe, right? Because they want to, they want to tone down the emotion. So your breathing is key. Your self awareness when you be, realize you're getting really upset or this, you just take some deep breath and you calm yourself down and you allow the emotions to settle down and you're realizing, okay, I'm feeling this way because of that situation. It's not really this. So I just need to, to check myself. So, so the first big thing here is having self awareness, paying attention to what's transpiring at the moment in you so that you can have the appropriate response in dealing with the situation. So that's that's the beginning point, preparation. I'm gonna talk through some more stuff here, but that's where it has to start. So this is huge. Self-awareness is huge. You must develop your self-awareness where I, you know, think of it this way. You learn to be where you are, where you are, okay? Um, we, we A lot of us, we're not present where we are. We, we're always somewhere else. But self-awareness says, pay attention to where you are, where you are. Be in the moment. Okay. Thank you, Ralph. I like yeah. that last statement especially. Uh, yes. That you learn to be where you are, where you are. I, I find that's profound. Yes. That's really, really profound. Yes. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, that is. So you must acknowledge your hurt and your need for healing for God to heal you. God does nothing for us that we don't ask him to do. He doesn't force himself on us. We have to invite him. See? And that's one of the mistakes we make in the church. We think if we just pray and we fast and we seek out all our hearts, everything will be okay. But God wants you to be aware of who you are. Jesus says, love your neighbor as you love yourself. He wants you to love yourself. So you need to know who you are. What are the things about me I hate? Why do I hate me this way? Why do I don't like these things? It is pain that makes us dislike who we are. We are bearers of the image of God, but we have learned to hate ourselves because the pain of other people have been passed on to us to dislike us and say things to us, you know, and label us. And so, no, we don't like ourselves. But when we identify what's going on and why we don't like ourselves and we invite God to bring healing there and say, God, I know this is not who I am. No, this is not the way you made me. Would you help me that I can see myself in a different way? I can feel better about myself. I can begin loving myself and caring for myself. And that's a whole other conversation how we do that. But what I'm saying is you must acknowledge your hurt and your need for healing so you can invite Christ in those places to bring healing. But know this. Men, know this. Your behavior is your responsibility in every, in any and every circumstance. You are responsible for your response to any given situation, good or bad. No one makes you do anything as an adult. Okay? So you need, that's this is the key point here. You are responsible for you and your your responses and your behavior and your choices. Okay? It is not your wife, it's not your girlfriend, not your mother, it's not your children, nobody. The choice you make, you made that choice. And you're responsible for that choice. Now, some of the choices have consequences. You have to face the choice and say, okay, this is the consequence. I need to deal with this and I need to move on. I don't want you to get mired in the in the in the in the in the bad choices you have made, which we have talked about earlier, but but you need to recognize it is nobody's fault. Nobody to blame. So I grew up, like I said earlier, with no real background to family and love and all of that. And I I came to the conclusion and the reality one day when God said to me, This is your life. And you could live as a victim and say, This is how you were brought up. Your, your, your stepfather didn't want you, he left you someplace, and the people didn't want you. And you know, you were called these names, you're treated this way, you were abused emotionally, physically, sexually, you, and live a life as a victim or recognize what I become is my responsibility. It's nobody to blame for that. I need to take responsibility for my life. So that is key. You are responsible for you. You can be responsible for your wife, for your girlfriend, for the people around you that are broken. You're not responsible for them. They, like you are responsible for you, they're responsible for themselves. They will make you think it's your responsibility, but it's not yours. You are only responsible for yourself. I can't say that enough. That's your responsibility. Don't pass that on to anybody else. Okay? So let me give you some, some 
very practical thing now you can do to bring healing for the place that you're hurting. Okay. Number one. So I already talked about I already talked to you about awareness. Self-awareness is huge. Taking responsibility for your life is huge. The next thing you need to think about, the next thing you need to do is to acknowledge you are hurt because we all are hurt. Okay? Think of it this way. What makes you so angry? You know, what makes me so angry with my spouse or my child or my friend? You know, what makes me so sad or, or depressed? That's, that's, that's hurt. That's pain. Okay? What makes me so, so afraid or, or, or or so so jealous, or I must be in the front of the line, or I must get the best treatment, or I get mad at people because then I do what I want. We hurt, so don't be overwhelmed, but work on one thing at a time. So let's uh, say, for example, let's say you have a tendency to to um to get quiet when someone begin to talk to you and ask, you ask you something. So, so okay, you want to ask yourself, why do I do that? You know, what in me that shuts me down when I should be speaking? Okay, so you need to focus inward and explore why you are so angry or, you know, um, not the person that triggers you, okay? It's why, why am I angry? Not why you made me angry, it's why am I angry? Has to be the question, okay? One of the things, back to the whole social media and the world we live in and all of this stuff, one of the things we don't do well, man, we don't know how to sit in the discomfort once we feel a discomfort, we want to find a way for it to go away. So we're going to find something to do that's going to make us feel good. But we haven't sat with the discomfort. Why am I feeling this? Why am I so angry? Why am I so hurt? And sit with it. And I guarantee you, the longer you sit with that and allow the noise to quiet down and just stay focused on that, God will bring to you, God will take you to the place where you can see where that is coming from inside of you. Okay? But you have to learn to sit with the discomfort. This takes time. You can't do it when you're in a rush. You can't do it when you're distracted. You must sit with it long enough to identify the cause or the source or the reason for your behavior. And it is not the person outside of you. It's not what's happening. It's you are given the response. Or so it's obviously coming from you. They're just triggering it. It's already in you. Why do I think in my head I don't want to be this way? But why when something happens, I become this way? It's the pain that is triggered by the behavior of the person. Once you identify the source, the reason, the cause of your behavior, you will realize that the person is not the cause. They are only triggering the behavior. And that's true for all of us. That's why Jesus said it's not what goes in the person that defies you, what comes out, because it's already there. It's already there. Okay? So that's the first thing. Acknowledge you have pain. Sit with one thing that is really about yourself. You see that is a real hindrance to your walk with Christ. And when it comes up, or you may, in the moment you probably can't do it, but a little later when you're by yourself, or when you go home late in the evening, early in the morning, go back to that situation and say, God, why did I get so angry at my daughter? Why did I get so angry at my wife? Why did I get so angry? You know? And sit with it. Where is this anger coming from? What is causing this? I am a follower of Jesus Christ. I'm a man of God. Why am I behaving this way? And why did I sit there and watch television for four hours, not even helping my wife or, or, or interacting with my children? What pain am I trying to, you know? What happened at work today that I am so mad at, at my boss that I, I come home, I take it out on everybody else? Those are the kind of things you do in a day, acknowledging your pain. Okay? Once you've identified the source of the pain, you can begin the work of healing because um, you, can, you can begin the, the, the work of healing from spewing your, um, stop spewing your, your buried anger on other people. And you can start asking God now to say, I see why I behave this way. Lord, help me. This is not who you created me to be. This is not where I want to be, you know. I am I am this way because um, I remember my father treating me this way. And so now I get angry when anybody does that. My father used to yell at me. So my boss yells at me, you know, 
I get mad and so I can't yell back at my boss, but I come home and I, I'm mad at my family. It's not about your boss, it's not about your family. Your family pays the price. You're passing the hurt on that you carried from a father who yelled at you. Now you're home with your kids and your wife and they're going to get the yelling because you're mad at your boss because of the pain of your father and now they have to take that. You have to deal with that. That's how we deal with that. Invite Jesus into the place, in this place of your life, and ask him to bring healing. This healing, in many cases, starts with acknowledging the hurt caused. Who did it? Sometimes it's unintentional. Sometimes you're, 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 the hurt you was passed on to you wasn't intentional. Just remember, your parents, the people that raised you, the people that raised me, the people I grew up with, and the abuse I went through, they were doing the best they knew how what they had. The slaps I get and the way I was treated, that's how they taught to risk it. That's how they taught, you know, calling stupid and idiot. And them. that's how they taught. So they, that's all they knew. So I have to recognize that a lot of the pain they passed on to me, they weren't saying, I'll make you measure up, I'm going to pass pain on to you. They were just coping with what they could cope with. But I was intentional now as an adult to say, I am not going to cope like that to pass pain onto my daughter, to my wife, to the people I work with. You know, So I acknowledge my pain. I invite Jesus into this place and I ask him to bring healing. You know, um, Because sometimes the pain came from a loving parent. You grew up in a loving Christian home. But some things that, that the way your father talked to you, or the way your mother talked to you about things about Christianity and a thing about sex and a thing about your life, they passed on some hurt to you that you you didn't realize they didn't realize that they thought they were protecting their child. Okay, so we don't blame them. You know, we don't we don't we recognize they were doing the best they know how as well. But we have to acknowledge the pain we carry. Oftentimes, that pain was caused by people, you know, themselves who were relating to us out of their own pain, and they're not even aware of it. So invite Jesus. Ask Him to bring healing for you, one thing at a time. But it's not a one and done exercise. You will return to the same place from time to time as you slowly acknowledge, forgive, accept, and accept the reality of what you have been through. And now, now you are not letting it have an unconscious control over your life. That's when the healing starts, the self-awareness thing now. And you'll find your, your being this way less and less and less till eventually that doesn't control you anymore. Then you move to another area in your life. Sometimes it requires you to spend time hiring a, a, a counselor, take some professional work, some, some deep work to, to, to deal with some of that healing. And sometimes the healing, the, the pain runs so deep from, from physical abuse or sexual abuse or something that was traumatic that, that it has a hole in your life. And you know Jesus, you love him. But that trauma, that pain is still there. And that back to the brain, it will always take over with the memory and the emotions. When you know in your head, you know the Bible verses, you know you're supposed to live, you know you're supposed to love, you know you're supposed to, to give, you know you're supposed to do all those things. But when something happens and it triggers and, the, and you're taking that, it, the pain takes over. And until you find it and bring healing for it, it will always dominate your life. One of the saddest comments I hear about people in church is when they say, you, you don't want to talk to, you know, you, you don't want to talk to Pastor, you know, he, he, he has a temper, you know, they're afraid of him. Okay? It's like, really? Is that the cry? Did anybody say that about Jesus? You know? And, and you have to stop and say, what would make someone be a follower of Jesus Christ and have such a temper that, that people are afraid to talk to them? And I say, it's pain. If you've been walking for Jesus all these years and you still feared by people because of your temper, I am saying you have not allowed Jesus to bring the healing in your life that you need. So invite him. It's not a one and done exercise. It takes time. Healing from our pain requires us to live consciously. We pay attention to what we are feeling. We take responsibility for our feelings and we handle them appropriately. So what I'm saying to you today is, <clears throat> if someone should ask you if you wanted to hurt the people 
you love intentionally, I am sure your answer will be no. And yet, you find yourself doing it over and over again. Why? Because while our answer is rational, our behavior when we hurt others is coming out of our emotions and out of our memory. And that's where we need to find the healing. There's two, two things I want to say to you. One is, um, I often say to couples, you can't build your marriage on your spouse. Okay? Yeah. You've got to take care of you and build your marriage on the foundation. We talk about this platform. Build your marriage on who you are in Christ. You know why? Because your spouse is as broken as you. And what end up happening is when we build our marriage on our spouse is that we end up allowing our spouse's behavior to start to define who we are, not who we are in Christ. So that's why we end up saying, I can't live with you anymore because you, you, you want two, three, four, you know, but, but, but when we started, we were both lovers. You we, we, we could, we could face the world and everything was great. And then a few years down the road, what changed? Why are we so distant? Because we have shifted who is forming us. Because if I'm continually being formed in Christ, then how I treat my wife wouldn't be based on how my wife behaves towards me. It would be how I, my treatment of my wife brings honors to Christ. And that's a hard one. Because like I say to people all the time, marriage is a covenant, not a contract. In a contract, you do your part and I do mine. If you don't do your part, I don't have to do mine. But in a covenant, it's not 80-50 or you know, 80-20 or 50-50. In a covenant, it's zero to 100. Whether you do your part or not, as a follower of Jesus Christ, I'm 100% invested in honor in Christ in how I treat my spouse. So that's, that's the first thing I want to say. So now what happened with you is, um, is that your wife became a common factor in that you buried that anger because you had somebody else to focus on. Okay. And when that person suddenly upset the very thing that was burying the anger, guess what? The anger came out. So what has to happen? It's still there. And, it, and, and, and until you rec stop, stop and sit and pay attention to and say, why is this angry? What makes me so angry? What it is, and you will, you will learn, they've got to take you back there to what it is that triggered this anger, whether it was how you saw your father protected your mother or how your sisters were treated or what, whatever. I'm just saying things, but something in you carries an anger that is kicked up when that peace is taken away because you, you buried it in the distraction to say, I have my wife to be her priest and a protector. And, it, and as long as that's working well, that anger doesn't come up. But as soon as it falls apart, you become a different man. It means, brother, it's not your wife, it's not your family. It's an anger in you that needs healing. And that takes time to sit with that. And this, Because I'll tell you this, it'll get you in trouble. In the time when you're least expecting something going to happen, and 99% of the people who are sitting in jail now for having committed crime, especially murder, it was never the plan. It was a seat in anger that burst out in, the, in, in, in a moment and they, and they kill somebody. Now they have lots of regrets when they when the rational mind kick in, but it's too late because the emotion already done the damage. So I would say to you, it's about it's about you spending time discovering whether it means going to a professional, talking to a counselor, someone who could really help you do that. I don't think all counselors understand, you know, counselors try to tell us if we change our thinking, we'll be okay. I'm saying, we've been doing that for years. It's not changing your thinking, brother. It's healing the wound, the emotional wound that, that overtakes your thinking so that you could be able to align your emotions with what you're thinking. Um, we have a problem. I, as, I, should, I, I think it's safe to say, as Caribbean people, about professional yeah. help. Uh, if I go for yeah. professional help, I am, I, 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 I am looked at as a psycho, how yeah, do we yeah. deal with that? That misconception yeah. Um, in, in our life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good question. So it begins with you. 
you have to recognize, and this takes time, especially when we, we, we depend on other people, when we depend on other people to give us our identity, to give us our sense of worth and value, then what they say and think about us is what makes us who we are. But when we start recognizing, wait a minute, who do I say I am? Who do, who do I see myself to be? How do I value myself? What do I want for myself? And then you have to, then you begin to recognize that it's not people that give me my identity. I am a follower of Jesus Christ. And if I need counseling so I can be better at who I am as a follower of Jesus Christ, well, then for that purpose, I am going. See, and you can call me psycho if you want, and that's okay. Because I know I'm understanding I'm a bearer of the image of Christ. God loves me. I love who I am. And I want to do the best. And there's a difference between loving who I am and being selfish and self-centered. So I'm not talking about being, here's the difference. The difference is I love me enough to do the things that will make me to be the best that I can be, to set healthy boundaries, to get help when I know it's beyond me, to, to find a counselor. I want to be the best dad I can be. I want to be the best husband I can be, the best boss I can be to my workers. But for me to do that, I have to deal with me. So I find the help I need. Now, what selfishness says is, is that I will use other people to get what I want for me. So I'm not talking about doing that. I'm talking about taking ownership for myself and dealing with the places in my life that gets in the way of me being a reflection of the Christ in me to those around me. So if they call me crazy, I'm okay with that. I want to be crazy for Christ. That's what Paul says. Tell me I'm out of my mind. That's okay. I'm out of my mind for Christ. So if you think of who you are as a follower of Jesus Christ, and you see the things in your life that's getting in the way of you being that more effectively, brother, get the help. That's, that's a popular um, poor theology that we teach people. How could self have no place when, when myself represents Christ? God created me in his image. So that means he put me on this earth with a representation of him. So self must have an important place. Now, Jesus says, if you're going to follow me, yes, you know, um, you have to deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. You know, and I was just recently listening to a podcast there and, and I heard the most, uh, the most sensible expression of what it means to take up your cross. You know, your cross and my cross are the places in our lives where we are not like Christ. Okay. That's the cross we deal with every day. The places that where I'm not like Christ is what fight against me to be like Christ. And that's what Jesus says. You have to be willing to die. You have to be willing to give up those parts of you that doesn't reflect me to be more like me. That's what that dying to self means. So that means, brother, that pain that causes you to have an unchristlike attitude towards people or how you treat them. I'm using an example. I'm not saying you do that. That part of you need to die. So you have to pay attention to self and to feelings and to allow God to come and bring healing there and say, God, I, this is not what I want to be. This is not known what, what you want me to be. So help me to heal from this anger outburst that I have with my wife, with my children. That is dying to self. See, so I can become more like Christ. So when, when they tell you self shouldn't be, and it, it's a complete misunderstanding theologically because myself, is, an import, is important to God because God created me, fearfully and wonderfully made. Unique me, Errol Karim. There's nobody in all of creation from Adam to, to the last child that just born the last few seconds there. None of them represent me. I am unique. So it's true for every human being. But we all have something in common. We bear the image of God in us. So you are loved. You are valuable, but you have to take care of you mentally, emotionally, spiritually, relationally. you got to take care of yourself. So when you hear theology about self and self must die, and then they're telling you about you should ignore you and don't pay attention to you, that is not scriptural. That's, 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 that's people who haven't done their own um, work and who have been made to feel guilty about trying to take care of themselves. And now they come pastors and they make everybody else feel guilty for taking care of themselves. But that's not what God called us to do. In terms of theology, sir, and 
may I appeal to your theological uh, skills? Um, there's a scripture that is quoted a lot. And yeah. sometimes I wonder if it is misunderstood. Um, Third John uh, 2, yeah. I wish that thou prosper and be in good health, yeah. even as yeah. thy soul prospers. Now, yeah. isn't my soul has to do with my mental capacity and my uh, to be melted, uh, mentally sound, that I need to look right. into to be mentally sound for the rest of the prosperity. I mean, that's it based on what I'm seeing. That's a prerequisite based on what I'm seeing. So yes. if, if if that has to do with my emotions and my yes. uh, and, and, and my mental issues, then I need to, to take care of it. Uh, 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 and what am I need to do? Am I, am I making sense or am I theological? Yeah. Screwed? No, you're right. You're right. And that's, that's the misconception. We hear the prosper and we just think about prospering materially. Okay. But, but what does it mean for your soul to prosper? The, you, you, my soul is made of all of the parts of me that of who I am. It's a person of who I am. And so how is my soul prospering? My soul is prospering when I'm doing the work to be the best version of me. Because if your soul is not prospering, brother, you're going to cut corner to try to prosper materially. Okay? You're going to lie. You're going to cheat. You're going to, you know, you're going to try to do things because, because you, you know, your soul is not in a healthy space. So a prospering soul, what he what he's getting at there is he's saying that from what he knows of them and how they're living and how they've been living life, that their soul, they're in a good place. So he says, the way you are living now and your, your soul is prospering, I pray you prosper that way as well. But here's the, 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 the catch and the secret. Whether I prosper materially or not, is not as important as, if, uh, that I pros uh, as, as it is important for me to prosper in my soul. But John was saying, to prosper in your soul means all of who you are is doing well. That is what he means. Rev, you have done a, 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 a tremendous job here uh, and really appreciate uh, your dedication, your commitment, and, and as you open up to us. And I think, though, that we want to pray. Those who are having marital issues and those who are thinking about divorce and and where are we today? We have guys who are hurting. Um, one of them who are struggling even with those who he thought would have been his help is not a help. Um, right. So you have, a, for me, a greater understanding of where we are today. And so I want to ask you um, to pray for us. Let's, 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 um, let's just thank God. God Father, we... we we are so blessed that we serve a, a God so amazing. A God that loves us so much that wants the best for us. Lord, you could have abandoned us in our disobedience way back in the garden, but you made a plan that sent your son to bridge that gap again so we can know you. And Father, today we have talked about that ways in which you have been misrepresented and misunderstood in what you want us to be. Would you forgive us today? And Father, help us to embrace a new perspective of what it is to be men that follow in Christ. Men who will embrace the reality of their pain and their emotions and the things that are that, that are needing healing in their lives. Father, I, I, I hear so much uh, pain and conversation today. I want to lift these men up to you. Lord, you know the circumstances, Lord, that they are in right now. You know, the pain, they're feeling, the fear they're carrying. But Lord, I want you to give them a fresh, a fresh backbone to feel so renewed and strengthened in you today. To say, yes, I am hurt and yes, I am broken, but my God brings healing. And I'll make a commitment today to pursue the places in my life that is getting in the way of God flowing through me that I could continue to be a witness. I want to leave a legacy of a man who was so committed to God that he can cry. He can say he's sad. He can express his emotion without hurting people. He can take responsibility for, for his actions and letting people know how much he cares and loves them. So Lord, touch each one here today. And you know, each heart that what we represent. 
and the struggle out there. <laughs> there are those who are struggling with loneliness and addiction and, and anger and unforgiveness and, and pain that they're carrying, Lord. Bring healing as they acknowledge it and they invite you in those places. So thank you for this conversation today. Thank you for these men. And I pray, Lord, you'll help us to continue these conversations and to, to form a, a bond and a group of men that could truly come to this platform and share their hearts and find the healing they're seeking. Because, you know, that's what you want for all of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.